Again, welcome everyone. We'll start um, in about a minute or so. Please feel free to put your names where you're joining us from. It's amazing to see so many people from all over um, and we will get started shortly. Awesome, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Shloka Iyengar. I am the Director of Marketing and Communications at SWB. Um, I started as a website coordinator last year and um, work with some amazing people, have the pleasure of really connecting with so many of you um, at these networking sessions. Um, please, we wanna have these networking sessions as of course a way to share knowledge and to you know uh, connect with one another so any ideas you have for you know anything that you might want to share Julianne is very gracious in sharing her expertise today but if if there's things that you want to share um, please let us know I will pass it on to Anna who is joining today from sunny sunny Portugal it seems with a lot of birds um, Anna please oh, yeah. go ahead and introduce yourself Yes, hi, I'm Anna. I'm usually in cold Finland, but today is an exception and I am in a sunny Portugal with loads of birds beyond the background. Um, so I'm a networking coordinator here at Statistics Without Borders. So um, I uh, help uh, Sloka, Sloka with the, the events that we're running here and um, I will be helping moderate this event as well. So if you see me muting you, that's because your mic is accidentally on. And uh, um, I will be uh, asking loads of questions in the chat and feel free to uh, connect with me as well. I will um, share my LinkedIn uh, profile in the chat later. Um, yeah, and uh, one thing is that I will uh, mention my email in the chat. And if you want at any point to share, uh, have a learning session like this one, host a learning session like this, like Judiana is doing today, um, please reach out and uh, we are very happy to organize it with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much again for joining. Those that are just joining, we are getting started. Uh, amazing to see so many people. Um, so as you know, the title for today's uh, webinar, today's talk is Improving Collection of Real, Real World Data. Judy Ann will be talking about her experience of young Mexican women that have breast cancer. Uh, Judy Ann, I'm sure you all read her amazing illustrious uh, bio. She received her BSc uh, and she has a PhD in statistics from the U University of Waterloo. She was a research fellow at the National Cancer Institute in Canada. Um, clearly she has tons and tons and tons of experience. For about seven years, she volunteered through the Global Cancer Institute, where she provided statistical oversight to develop perspective, the prospective cohort research database for the Joven and Furte young women with breast cancer in Monterey and Mexico City. This was thought to be the first transdisciplinary database for Latino women. Without further ado, uh, welcome Judy Ann. Thank you so much again for sharing your knowledge and information 
I will sh start sharing my screen. Okay, thank you. And so um, I've provided some, the major reference for this work. So any details, I, I, I didn't want to bog us down too, too much in details, but there are a number of details that are required to um, give you a sense of where we're at now. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, Sloka has kindly provided a lot of po um, pointers on this. And so this will be a comprehensive talk, but it will be informal as well. So later on, ask your questions. Um, so this is a long-term volunteering as compared to, I know the statistics with the borders are usually have much shorter ventures. Um, and I'll give you the reason and how we got here on the longer one. And just to give you a contrast, because I think there are opportunities in this line for longer term than maybe you've thought of doing it for. I'm going to go through my professional background with a focus for students, um, the skills and the, what happened in this particular volunteering, and then proceed to more generalization and then the breakout rooms for everyone to be able to discuss. Next, please. So now this is headed towards the students. Um, and I'm really glad that Sloka's pointer that, you know, they would want to know more and by all means, but we're gonna go back even further to high school here. Uh, but grade 11, I really was considering being an MD. And then I got realistic. Number one, I need more sleep than most MDs get. Uh, I can do these short-term research uh, stints of almost 24 hours and I did one of those recently in a grant time um, but also the other thing was I was better at math and I was interested in science so it came time first year I went to Waterloo and my first year was on the math faculty side with science options and then in first year, I fell in love with quantum chemistry. And this may sound like a strange one, but I always wanted to know the whys. And so I switched after first year to chemistry and math double major and then proceeded along in that modality until in fourth year, after having done all the labs that all the chemistry people did and the math uh, backgrounds, I found that brilliant people were coming out in, this is early seventies, brilliant people were coming out with PhDs in quantum chemistry and not getting jobs and therefore having to either retrain or rethink the whole process. And I thought that doesn't sound like a good prospect. There was a brand new program, the forerunner of biostatistics back over in mathematics. So I switched back. And at that point, I was really thinking, did I waste all those years, all that heavy labor in labs, especially? And for a while, it looked like maybe that was true. Um, but when you'll see at the bottom line, all of this came to fruition. Yes, my subject matter is statistics. That is my main formal training. Um, however, all those years in chemistry and even that thought of being an MD came to fruition in one cohesive whole. And so I encourage any students or early career people, look at what your skills are, look at what your other background is and look for cohesiveness so you will feel whole at the bottom line because you got to love what you're doing um no matter where you end up you're going to be working long hours and you better love it <laughs> so to, to don't give up until you get all of you into all of what you are doing um, now two relative things here um, i am professionally credited and was a part of actually putting it together for both canada and the US. And this comes with an interesting prospect that it's got this cohesiveness of formal training and applied to as appropriate to other areas. So I will have more about that later. Um, selected employment that, that's relevant today, the Henrietta Banting Breast Center um, database creation, and which went on for a few decades there, um, about 10 years in uh, at the Canadian Cancer Trials Group, uh, which is the Canadian 
uh, clinical trials group in the American system. And then since retirement, I've had the most productive, enjoyable research life ever. So I'm not retired. You'll see that. <laughs> anyway, next, please. Um, so as far as skills go, now I, I have to put this in the context of breast cancer, because in breast cancer, ever since the 70s, and especially the San Antonio Breast Cancer Group, it has been not just encouraged, but mandatory that if you're going to succeed, you got to span the whole prospect of rate right from survivors on through. And this is actually was exactly what I ended up doing because the clinicians I was working with in Toronto and then later in Kingston all wanted this full spectrum of experience. And I was thinking about actually, it's really greater than five decades. We won't count <laughs> the lost one there. Definitely more than four. And I got into at the ground level development and then implementing both in the prospective cohort, which became relevant in um, the Mexican experience, but also in the clinical trial data, because we, we pulled a lot of clinical trial elements into this cohort. Um, and then personally endorsing the fact that to succeed, you've got to be able to speak to all the different people through from detection on through um, and be able to speak, I, I always say in English to them because they will not always have the full technical experience. And I consider it the statistician's important role to be able to pull everything together and keep it cohesive, but also best of each of those different groups. As soon as you let one of them slide, you'll have an unbalanced design, an unbalanced carry through, and that will be trouble, number one, for you. So uh, get you used to this exciting realm of pulling all these different things together. Next slide, please. So this volunteer opportunity came along just as I was, quote, retiring. <laughs> A longtime medical oncology person I'd known from uh, Toronto and then on through the clinical trials work, he went the uh, different endocrine trials that I was responsible for. And the application was to take place in Mexico in a limited resource setting. So I went from top of line, quote, in the US Canadian realm down to a limited resource, um, but they had unknown unassessed needs of young me Mexican breast cancer women diagnosed under 40. So what did we know? Well, in developed country setting, young breast cancer patients have a very aggressive disease. They get diagnosed anywhere from teens through to 30s in this under 40 category. And this impacts women in their education, their body image, their uh, partners in marriage, motherhood, the whole realm of their life. They're very vulnerable. In the Mexican perceptions a priori, they thought that they had more women in this under 40 category than would have been expected in the US, Air Canada, other developed nations. And they had large metastatic tumors. So when you start looking at the how it affects people, it's going to be even worse in this setting. And we set up a plan to for both patient and clinical web-based surveys from baseline to five years, we were going to do the, we needed to do the whole thing. We needed the patient reported demographics, also their perceptions of psychosocial, psychiatric, sexual functioning. And I emphasize, and I'll say this again, before distant metastases, because a lot of the, uh, assessments don't stop at distant metastases. Then you got a bias. Like, what is it really? Is it the disease or is it the women and the trials they, they're going through? And treatment-related issues. And the clinical reports, all the standard measures. Um, now, in a limited resource setting, they do not have uh, guaranteed access um, to their laptops, computers, power sources are minimal. And so we had to supply program supply tablets. And even for the clinics, we needed program supplied tablets. 
Uh, but this also gave us a level of control. Next slide, please. Um, and thank you, Sloka, for doing all this forwarding. I'm working through AOL, which has high uh, protection, but is very poor for all of you being able to access. So anyway, so we had some very uh, humorous moments because I have got English, obviously, um, being from Canada, I have some, and having lived in France for a year and a half, I have some French capability, having lived in Germany for two and a half years, I have some German capability, I have zero Spanish. So we had to, uh, a lot of humorous moments uh, between, in this language context, they wanted the good solid English interfaces because they are going to have to interact and do comparability in English. If their work is going to transfer, they need solid English. And so we had a lot of fun in these two languages. Um, international interfaces. Right from the beginning, we knew that we had to have solid data. We have to have pre-planned definitions instruments and scoring that are going to travel. We have to have high quality data and data management in the transdisciplinary area and quality assurance across everything. The young breast cancer programs were the start. Um, Ann Partridge out of Dana-Farber and Harvard and Pink out of Toronto uh, for Canadian uh, were the starting points. And Cynthia, our uh, major medical oncology who had trained and gone through the uh, program, Global Cancer Institute program, we'll give you more about that in a minute, um, had worked with both Anne and Ellen. And so she had a natural interface she wanted her Mexican program to be a part of. Um, then we have, if you're going to do anything in breast cancer, you have to have standards. You can't uh, just go off and do your own thing, or you'll ne never be comparable, and they won't know whether it's you, what you used, or whether it's your patients. So we used standbys of European Organization for Research and Treatment, Cancer Quality of Life Questionnaire Core 30, QLQC30, the breast cancer specific element of the QLQ BR23, hospital anxiety, this last one, hospital and anxiety and depression scale, I was not familiar with, but it's a quick and easy psychiatric one, which has got validity. Sexual functioning, likewise, we used um, the besides the elements, there are some elements in the BRQ. Uh, BR23 uh, for sexual functioning, but they're not very detailed. So these, we use two standard methods in that one, the uh, sexual, female sexual functioning index and the sexual satisfaction inventory. And then this last part were, besides the fact that I had interdisciplinary experience, these last two standardizations I'd been a part of uh, creating. So the breast oncology local disease, we actually have the very first, we think, use, um, published use anyway. And um, I was a part of that with Richard Sellers, one of the two statisticians on the task force. And we were the first users because it was early. It takes time to get to interface to other modalities. This is it for your first use. The standard definitions of efficacy endpoints, these are all the different clinical trials groups. Oh, and I should have said back with the task force. All the different trials groups in the US system. So, again, I was on the Canadian side of this. Statistics, um, one of the two representative statistics across all the different groups. Um, and then the standard definitions for efficacy endpoints really came up in the endocrine trials because we had all these different endocrine trials across the North American system and in Europe in particular, but also across the rest of, of the world. And we'd all use different endpoints. Now, how comparable are your results? Well, they, they weren't. So we set up a system of endpoints that has reached out to a lot of different applications and is very useful. Now, you'll find more about this. This is the clinical paper I'm referencing here. You'll find out more details there for those of you that want a, a greater background. Next slide, please. So the data collection, each web-based survey, 
we had formatted entry fields. I call this straight jacketing your data. We have formatted entry fields. We have predefined data types, pre-specified drop-down choice or multiple choices. Responses were required before proceeding. So this is how you collect uh, complete data. It, it's fairly common in other areas, not always used in medical ones, and we thought it was appropriate. So you don't get to go into your next question until you answer your, your response, give your response. And then the completed questionnaire results are uploaded automatically. Next, please. Uh, data quality assurance steps every six months. And this is my... Uh, <laughs> clinical trials coming through here. We do it every six months. They were going to do it every six months. You don't want to get behind. You don't want a monster to have to clean up at the end. Um, this complete data. So basically we have the data within a survey getting straightjacketed, but you'll understand from the number of surveys that we've got coming in, you have to make sure that your patients are getting all their surveys completed. So that requires a bit of human effort, but it's quick and easy. Um, we have data entry types where you, uh, you can have confusion. And you, it looks like in the medical side and the database side in particular, you end up, anyone who's worked with Excel spreadsheets, you end up with someone trying to give you your background information with annotated. That cannot go forward. It'll junk your fields. So you've got to be very careful of getting all those unannotated out or you're going to have problems when you transfer it to a statistical database. Common error uh, was data format. We have two major systems, month day or day month, and it is gets confounded. And you find out with all of a sudden negative uh, follow-up times, <laughs> negative times to recurrence. So we had to make sure that when you start to get these issues that you have a confirmation system of which system it was really and get it corrected. This next part, not everyone does, and I strongly recommend, internal consistencies. If, and the issue is if you've got a person who's got a recurrence, then you've got to make sure that all the different references to those recurrences or endpoints are consistent. And it can be at single points in time or between points in time. And it just takes a little bit. Uh, this is my uh, major starting point because I know that as soon as I get inconsistency and someone says, do it one time with this stuff and one time with other stuff, if you don't have everything consistent, you're going to get a mixture and you're going to get inconsistent results out. So I, I don't proceed to analysis until I get everything together. And at this point, I have to uh, admit to being obsessive compulsive with data. And, but if you don't, you it's your neck that gets in the middle because it's you are responsible for producing consistent results at the bottom. And then well, I can call a clinician um, problem just by looking at the inconsistencies, but I'm obviously not the person that resolves it. It's got to go to the medical records and the medical side, and especially when you're talking Spanish, that belongs to someone else from this project. Next, please. Okay, so we've now got the issue. We can reduce it to who is eligible. 19 out of 135, and this is like a concert diagram for those of you that are in the clinical, 19 out of 135 um, were uh, refused to be approved. That's, that's fine. There may have been some very good reasons for that. Uh, five revoked their consent. Again, this is something they had to come to grips with. Um, and we just have to recognize and accept. Now, here's the start of the bad news scenario. We have 21 excluded, seven were benign. We want the starting invasive. Seven distant metastasis at diagnosis. This, this is our young group. Seven died before they had a chance to complete the surveys. And we have 90 patients that form the basis. Next, please. Um, now then, the, as this is a quick rundown of who we had at baseline, um, as expected, uh, they're under 40, and we have uh, age range 21 to 40. 
59% of them were uh, had at least high school education. So for this group, that's pretty uh, good education level. Um, it's kind of unfortunate, 25% would like to have more biologic children, which may or may not happen. Um, now here's, this gets into the clinical issues. We have done very well in developed countries by having early detection by a, a number of screen modalities. Uh, under 40, it would usually be ultrasound or mammography, uh, sorry, ultrasound or MRI. Uh, 40 and up is the realm for mammography as your first line. In this scenario, 84% of the people are having their diagnosed detection by themselves or their partners. That means immediately you've got advanced disease. Uh, very fortunately, 51% of the women did get to a doctor they got within three months. That is fairly good. Uh, you can have a lot of delay if people are afraid of what they're going to have find when they get go to an MD. To the best of these 84%, they did the right thing. And then here comes the bad news. 39% of the women did not get diagnosed until after 12 months. That is scary. Next slide, please. And then we start to look at all of these people had to have public insurance to get treated. Uh, the uh, have very low income at the time of this, that uh, less than 11,600 pesos was equivalent to $610 a month. 22% of the patients were their sole financial contributor. Good news, 73% between baseline and two years were maintained their current partner. Next, please. And now we start to get into the clinical side and I'm just pulling out the most relevant parts here um, from an epidemiologic point of view, public health point of view. The body mass image of these patients, 66% of them were overweight or obese. Clinical stage, uh, and that could affect how their um, etiology of getting breast cancer. We'll look at it in other ways later. Clinical stage, 48% of these ladies came in with advanced disease at diagnosis. Next, please. So uh, quick comparison, 48% of the Mexican prospective cohort had advanced disease at diagnosis. And just along the bottom there, I give a, a quick uh, heads up that 51% uh, did come in in a reasonable time frame, but 39% were diagnosed way too late. And this is comparable, relatively speaking, to Mexican retrospective series, and then other Latin American countries, uh, Peru, Chile, and Brazil. New Zealand is a bit lower. They have a uh, New Zealand, Australia, fairly similar um, perspectives to in the medical system to Canada. Uh, the US DOD, 17%. Next, please. The uh, quick summary, because these anyone who's done work in the psychosocial, psychiatric, sexual disease areas knows you get a lot of fine details. You can go see the clinical paper for them. The uh, again, I emphasize the importance of stopping your assessments once you get to distant metastasis in order to be able to clearly delineate what is the primary disease experience versus what is metastatic. Um, we had to examine patients in two different ways. Like your uh, standard clinical trials or other areas, some hospitals 
uh, will get through your ethics approvals faster than others. Um, so we went down to only 73 out of the 90 patients actually were able to do these assessments in this pilot study. Now they're through ethics, and the, they should get better, do better in the future. Um, and then you start, uh, so you're starting with a difference at that point. There's nothing that's beyond our point of view, what we can do with that one in the pilot phase. And so you, then you start, you have to drop your patients once they reach distant metastasis, which are going to be quite a few. Um, and so your numbers start to dwindle. So this is everyone who did one of these surveys has got complete answers, but you have patients missing from the points of view in this pilot phase. Um, and so you basically, you have all this possible information if you examined group changes, but you, if you start to go down to matched patient changes to look at what is the real difference from baseline to two year, you're down to 44 patients roughly. Um, so that's just a heads up. Those are beyond our control. But if you're reading these papers, you're going to notice, well, you had complete data. Yes, we did, but only in complete data if they are being approved uh, to be taken. Um, and, you, uh, and we dropped out the ones that we didn't think to be relevant. Significant, so we did it both ways. Um, you know, we did have significant improvement in global quality of life and the HADS anxiety from baseline to two years. That's great. Next, please. So now here are the summaries and our actionables. And this is from other data. Obviously, you can't compare your under 40s to uh, the, the over and above, um, but it's up to 15% in Mexico are thought to be under 40. And US Hispanics and the references there, you can track those down to see the ins and outs of roughly 7%. So there's two major directions we can take here. Number one, we could have different genetics um, because of population differences. Although we are talking US Hispanics, they're fairly close to Mexico, um, but there could be different uh, environmental issues. You can tease that apart with biomarkers assessments, which are in progress. The other major direction is, and common that in undeveloped countries, that you do get higher proportion under 40. And it could be that if your lifespan, this breast cancer increases uh, in frequency with age. And it could be that if you have a lower lifespan um, due to other competing risks, removing people, that will shift your proportion to being under 50, under 40 being higher. It's a work in progress. They've got something to look for. The um, part of 48% being diagnosed with advanced breast cancer, 9% died by two years. You just don't get that in uh, Canada or US. So we start to look at actionable items that could bring in the cases earlier, improve the detection, improve, move the shift to the um, cancer that's being treated to lower stage. 84% of the, again, were diagnosed by themselves or partners. Only 3% practice the monthly Mexican recommended breast self exam. Now, I do not, in general, for those of you that are in this controversy uh, between breast self exam or screening with machines, this is not a general recommendation, but if 84% of the patients are getting diagnosed with by themselves, then this could be a scenario where it would be very valuable to practice breast self-exam. We're gonna work at the other end of getting other improvements too, but you could possibly improve your time to seeking medical care if you did the breast self-exam in this or other scenarios. 51% of the, percent of the patients sought medical care relatively quickly. 39% were way too long in uh, getting diagnosed. And the uh, oncologists in Mexico thought that this diagnostic delay may come from not su suspecting that it could be malignant and therefore not getting going earlier. 
BMI, and this is another controversial area. So you've got 66% of the patients coming in overweight and obese, and 73% in the general Mexican population. You can give them weight loss programs. This actually is controversial whether weight loss will help you in, in how long you live or affect your course, but this is not a bad place to start. And if word gets out, it might be not a bad idea, um, recognizing that it usually costs more to eat better food. So this may or may not be possible, but weight loss, it's, not, it's a good actionable. Economics, 98% uh, were low income, 22% of the patients were sole financial contributors to the, their monthly income. Uh, there's no immediate actionable, but just a heads up, this is where things were at. And it puts extra value on the government and other volunteer actions, you know, supporting donations and whatever. Quality of life, um, emotional and sexual function targets. We have reference information here uh, for targeted interventions, which are already ongoing, especially in Mexico City. 25% uh, wanted more biologic children. This is not affordable right now. Um, so it's more, you gotta tell people up front. Um, so they know where they're at, so they don't have unreasonable expectations. And this is where outside working with the U.S. Um, will help. Next, please. Okay, so here's our summary approach here. We, you cannot compare apples and oranges. So it's really important that people start to move more standardly, no matter what you're doing, to validated instruments, standardized definitions, even if you're talking about your regular uh, interactions in your databases in a, within a single institution. But if you want to go across other institutions, other scenarios, you've got to recognize that unless you have standardized, you're not going to be able to compare. I think technology is moving to the um, more forward all the time. And if you can do it in Mexico, you can do it in other undeveloped areas. You can do it more in other developed countries to uh, get straight jacketed data and minimize your uh, selection biases to the greatest possible extent. In this case, we, they had sustained participant engagement and it wasn't um, a bias when you are offering them. If your motivation to take part in assessments becomes we'll actually treat you or off, be able to offer you something, you get good buy-in. And uh, it sort of becomes a collaborative effort. Promotion of data availabilities was always the goal. They can't stand it alone. And so they had to be able to uh, have the good quality data that other people like the City of Hope uh, will be interested in partnering with. The large tumors are attractive. It's sad for the women, but this will help in far as uptake and offering them a better spectrum of choices because a lot of people in the US just don't have, and this is good news, they don't have the large tumors that lend themselves to looking at etiology. This will help Mexicans, this will help everyone in general. Routine review, just don't let the mountain build up, or you may work with a messy product all the time. And the uh, volunteers, um, and we'll go into this next slide, please. So this was a long-term volunteering. I didn't set out to go for seven years, but in retrospect, that's realistic. Uh, you've got to get your stuff together. You've got to get your patients in, and then you have to have follow-up. The Avon Foundation uh, to the funding to the Global Cancer Institute, brought in the uh, Developing World Fellows. And then they, part, they gave them some basic quick on the spot training. They asked, what is the biggest question that needs to get addressed in your area? 
And then they matched with people, um, most of them in the Northeast, um, at Dana-Farber and other uh, places, and uh, Mass General and others. So all those, the Northeast Johns Hopkins. Um, and I got brought in because the longtime uh, person I'd worked with, Paul Goss, was at Mass General. And he had been very active in Canada before he left Canada. And then he was the study chair of a lot of our endocrine trials. And so this was a natural linkage. But the main thing, I don't think you have to look at it as this is specific example that was the only one that's possible. I think the main aspect that I see in the Statistics Without Borders volunteering is you've got a vetted framework. You are safe. You have trusted connections and you have good matching of skills. That's for you and for your clients. You basically need a safety framework. I had it through my long-term colleague and the others framework issues you've seen but that's I think is your essential no matter where you're volunteering look for your safety framework um, American Society of Clinical Oncology has got some prospects they have large and increasing global focus they are funding the um fellows and the early career oncologists all over the world and they've got linkages that I think you might want to look at and other opportunities through your known auspices you people will get to discuss and think about and come up with some good creative suggestions. Uh, next, please. And your ultimate volunteer and new product. Uh, Florence Nightingale, I don't think you could give any better specifications. Um, I use her and have used her in my teaching. I have used her in uh, reaching out to high school students locally. Um, but you know, the, she, is, she is my ultimate role model. Next, please. So why volunteer? Um, we have lots of skills. And uh, my prospects are I'm going to live to be 96 to 100 based on my genetic familial background of who I take after. Um, and I've watched previous generations like my father who uh, and grandfather who both kept retiring and kept going on. And I sort of felt like, OK, I think I've got enough data here. I think I can predict um, my grandmother lived to 96 and my great aunt to 100, her sister to 100, who pronounced herself 100 percent on her 100th birthday. And I've got too many neurons, I cannot stop right now. So I'm active, I continue active in breast cancer research, active in journal reviews, active in many other aspects. And this was just one that met my uh, criterion of being obsessive compulsive and continuing in breast cancer. And personal research is ongoing. As soon as co exit from COVID, I'm looking for my long project personal research. You'll hear more about that when we get it out of COVID and get my last lab data in. Um, like Florence Nightingale, our work may be useful elsewhere. So just I leave you with those thoughts. Next, please. Now, um, this list is pre um authors. These are all the major people. You can understand that there are a lot of students, um, residents, research fellows, all on the Mexican side. And without those people, we would be nowhere. Um, their system is of uh, research engagement is very much like the US and Canada. We, uh, Cynthia has mentioned earlier, worked with Ann Partridge, and that was as part of the Global Cancer Institute. Prior to that, she was up with in Canada with Ellen Warner and uh, Global Cancer Institute, my contact, Paul Goss, medical oncologist, with a specialty in endocrine um, therapies and research and modifications. Um, and then the task force, Richard Sellers, if you ever have an opportunity to pat him on the back, please do. Uh, otherwise, Consider using his uh, local disease uh, framework. It'll immediately straight jacket that aspect, especially if you're interested in radiation oncology or surgical oncology. Next, please. 
And then the two references, the focus has been on the methods today, but you can't do that independent of the, that's the first paper. You cannot do that independent of the clinical. And this is following along pretty much um, as I do in, in regular practice. You get the clinical out first. That's why you've, you're doing things. And then you work on uh, other aspects. And this was my other aspect. I work on biomarkers or modeling, biostats modeling in my own personal research. But this was the takeoff here. Next, please. Now we have three breakout rooms. And uh, a series of questions that Anna and Sloka are going to pop up as you choose your uh, room. And then I'm, um, I'm going to throw it back to Sloka and Anna for the next. Yes, thank you so much, Julianne. Um, I would love to ask you some questions that came in during your talk. And uh, you. if we have time afterwards, we will go to breakout rooms. Okay. So. The first question was uh, from Solmaya. I bet I didn't pronounce it right, I'm really sorry. Uh, but the question was, um, was this project planned and designed by Canadian investigators or are there Mex Mexican investigators involved and in what capacity? Okay, so it was started by US investigator Paul Goss uh, out of Harvard, who was the co-director of the Global Cancer Institute. And Cynthia and others, um, and I, I'm, I'm, my Spanish is still not good. Okay, so I'm not gonna kill her last name. Um, you, you've got it, <laughs> your two paper references there. Um, Cynthia was the fellow slash PhD uh, who was, on target uh, up in the Global Cancer Institute. And then it they brought me in because they recognized that they're not, this is non-standard. They need a statistician. So Canada part, solely Canada part, although I'm a part of, was a part of the US system, uh, came in at that point. And the if you look at the uh, clinical paper, you'll see that this was put together by Mexican psycho-oncologists, uh, psycho oncologists, uh, vast variety, and they even had Mexican uh, patient survivors. And they put, and they had to have the interface even between pink and the young and strong to be Mexican oriented. And I came in as they had come to the conclusion, the general idea of how they're going to do it. I helped with, all, with my experience to get the questions together, to get the survey comprehensiveness together. And then it, it and it, but that was not, I would, I'm, not uh, the sole person on that. They brought in the HADS, which was their psychiatric experience. Um, and it's so it, it's completely like any other uh, breast cancer project. It goes across everyone, but it was Mexican. And the actual wording of that contributed zero to that. And every time someone forgot, they had to do a translation and put it over into English for me. <laughs> We want that umbrella and sun too. Yes. Anna. I'm sorry. Yeah. My boyfriend <laughs> just really needs the umbrella. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. There were a few follow up questions. So, were the instruments designed with Mexican input or only by the developed country investigators? Uh, so we had a survey, the original demographic survey, which we didn't put um, requirements to have a complete response on. Okay, um, the, and that was those were all uh, Mexican, and because they um, they didn't have the response requirements, <laughs> they're very incomplete. Okay, um, but they did have that. That's the lead-in survey. The lead-in survey is completely all Mexican takeoffs on the pink and the um, uh, young and strong, and the and the translation was user friendly to be at the and tested by patient survivors. Um, the international surveys have had uh, 
Spanish people being from more Portugal and Spain and other countries around the world. So they are they have validity and they are used in other settings, not just clinical trials. So you 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 have a development process for um, what's relevant to a breast cancer patient. And that and the and the, the especially the breast cancer, the BR23 is specific to breast cancer. So they have the common one, the ULQC30, that is all cancers, and then they break off into your rooms on breast cancer. And those, yes, those are international, but you you we've we've just did not get the results that we pared down to only publishing at this point those things that are validated and go across countries because that is the only solid data we have. The others are just too incomplete. They give you some hints that you might wanna break out and try and develop something on, but it's not readily available or ready for action yet. And what about, were they statistically, were they validated other than statistically? Yes. Surveys, I oh, yes. Oh, definitely. Yes. Uh, the, the, so that's a part of validation. Uh, the EORTC has been going at it for decades, like I think uh, four or five decades, something like that. So, yeah, they are validated. Uh, they pare down uh, from down to only 30 from starting much higher number of questions. Then we have another question, which is what software did you use to design and collect the data? Um, okay, so that it was, um, that's beyond my stop. Okay, uh, so I am not a computer science person. Okay, so I'm gonna have to leave it to, there was a web-based process um, and, I, and, I, and I don't have the answer to that. Um, I, I could probably, if anyone wants that, uh, web-based collection, I can ask for that one. Um, we extracted data to Excel spreadsheets. Okay, very simple. And the Excel spreadsheets had to have a dual identity of uh, English and Spanish. It's, oh, drat. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm going to ignore that. Just ignore it. It's like your birds, okay? Ignore that in the background there. Okay. okay, it'll stop after eight <laughs> rings. Okay, uh, so we went to spreadsheets, Excel spreadsheets that are universally available. We kept them in, in Spanish and English, and we developed the drop down menus to be in both languages. Okay, and we have two more questions for you before you can run and answer that. Um, how were the survey questions designed? I suppose they were constructed using the various references and was the analysis mostly uh, survey data analysis? Uh, clinical data. Uh, but so very after we, we looked at the surveys, first of all, the Mexican based ones, and we just did descriptive statistics and then we quit. Okay. Um, uh, the uh, surveys were they're, they're pre-specified how you be to be able to be comparable, but they do have the subcomponents and they do have the main things that we uh, put on it were the um, aspects of how you, which patients go into it. And that's where I'm saying that you had uh, complete survey data. That part is great, um, but not all the patients got to due to ethics board lack of approval. And then we put on the restrictions of nothing up until distant, um, after distant. And then we did the analyses that, you know, by each of the different questions, by globals, by subgroups, and uh, very thoroughly worked up all of that. Okay, and I think our final question, and I think we will skip the breakout rooms this time. Oh, sorry, but I'm sorry, I got, I, I, I followed your instructions, Sloka. Be relaxed. Absolutely, no <laughs> worries. No, this is great. And I think it's great to have so many questions as well. So I think, uh, I think this is a, a positive. Um, 
there is interest in asking more from you. So uh, would you have an email address to share sure. so that people can share my you? email address, Anna and Sloka. Okay. Sure. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Well, let's do another minute. If you have any questions, shoot them in the chat. Okay, Shloka was faster than me. Uh, so uh, Judy Ann's email address is in the chat now. So um, feel free to contact her uh, for more details and uh, we will share the deck later. And uh, yes, thank you so much for sharing. No problem, thank you. Thanks for all your organization. See... <laughs> thank you. And I will welcome. check up about the web-based collection uh, that that was that part is not me <laughs> okay well thank you everyone thank you so much for coming so julian once we have yeah we can send you know if there's anything else you would like to add to that email we could do that as well sure well why don't you send the questions around even though the breakout rooms didn't take place if if you know that if that's helpful to people sure Sure. Yeah. Thank is, it you also, everyone. is it okay if I also send the PDF to everybody? Oh sure. Oh. Sure. Yeah. So the so the uh, so the P, the PDFs were the authors' copies. So as it's I am doing it, I am allowed to share for sure. educational and other personal uses. You never give that away. So yes, absolutely. How about PDF of the uh, presentation that I was sharing? Is that okay? Oh, sure. Oh, that's okay. fine. It's fine. Yep. Oh. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Thank you. This was amazing. So glad you had time um, and interest <laughs> in doing this no for us. I think we had a lot of amazing questions. No, thank you. And I'll go find out what that call was. <laughs> yes. Thank you again, Julian. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Be in touch. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.